Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Heather Wallace, the president of Revlon Americas, a global company that markets over 15 brands in over 150 countries, including Elizabeth Arden, which was acquired in 2016. And combined, they have a total of approximately $2 billion in annual revenues. But like most organizations that we had on the Reboot Chronicles, the 2020 pandemic has put a lot of revenue and cost pressures on the company. And their team is rebooting Revlon in real time. So we're going to talk about that today. And Heather, um, you joined Revlon at a very interesting time about a year ago, right when things were kind of settling in and, you know, a global reset and rebooting uh, Revlon. So uh, we're curious, um, why did you join the company? Yeah, so I actually joined for exactly that reason. Uh, when I when I was first meeting with the people at Revlon, it was very clear that they saw the need for change and that they were ready to make the change needed to turn the business around. So we have such iconic brands with Revlon and Elizabeth Arden. Um, if I were a little girl playing with my Barbie dolls and you asked me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I might have said the president of Revlon <laughs> if I had had, you know, that much forethought. But, but really, for me, they're iconic brands that need to be future proofed. And in order to turn around a business, it's about solving the right problems. And so solving the right problems on the brands and on the business, but really driving a cultural change that can enable transformation. And that's really what I was excited about. So um, I had no idea the pandemic was going to turn into what it was. So nothing like right. starting your job in Manhattan the first week that Manhattan actually shuts down because of the pandemic. So that was sort of what I was facing day one. Um, but, was, you know, uh, joined for the challenge and have enjoyed every minute of it so far, despite how yeah. difficult it's been. It sounds like it. That was like March 2020. Is that when you started? March 2020. So clearly you were uh, talking earlier than that. So they, they weren't, this was not in reaction to it. They were obviously bringing in a pro to uh, start rebooting things. And how, how have you approached it and how's your team doing now, you know, a year later? So it's, it's interesting because when they brought me in, yes, they brought me in as a catalyst for change and to drive the change that was needed, but we had no idea what was going to hit us with the pandemic. And so I joined an organization poised for change. They had just done a restructure. They had reorganized, changed ways of working, reduced headcount. But then immediately as we started the work, we shut down the office and everybody's working remotely. So I joined an organization that was in the midst of and just beginning change management. And then the whole world basically turned upside down. So how do you bring a team together? How do you drive them forward with fewer people, new roles and responsibilities, and also a, a completely different approach to working from home. So, you know, that was what I was facing day one. And, and I would say the best thing about it is that uh, we had to come together. We had no choice. The demands on the team and on the business were so great because of the challenges that COVID presented, and especially in the beauty category, that we had to come together to find a path forward. So at least we had a common goal, which was to figure out how to deal with change that we had not anticipated. Right. And as you looked at rebooting the business and, and now a year later, what, what are the, like the two or three most important things? So you mentioned culture, obviously, and, you know, your people and all of that from a market perspective. What's what's been the biggest uh, challenges, I guess, you faced? I, I think that the the pandemic has just accelerated the speed of change. Yeah. And I think that a historical view of channels. Right. If I think about from a customer perspective, the historical view of channels is, is completely changing as every retailer and every company is responding in different ways. So the speed of change is faster than ever. And the dynamics in terms of where consumers are shopping for what kinds of products, that it's a it's a shift from where we've been in the past. So historically, we really operated as three divisions. We operated a pro division, a prestige luxury division, and then the mass division. But now all of those lines are changing. So how do we break down the silos between the divisions? How do we identify where the consumer is going and right. meet he or she where they want to meet and shop our brands? So that was one shift, kind of going from silo to, sounds like market focus, you know, the Americas, 
Europe, you know, Asia, that kind of approach where it's more, uh, not more bundled, but just more coordinated by geography. Yes, more coordinated by geography. And then the other piece that we did was that we actually looked at, if you think about the size of Revlon, we're not we're not small by any means. We definitely have scale, but we are not the largest player in our industry and in our categories. And we have an opportunity to be much more nimble. So if we think about our way to the consumer is through the customer, then we really need to be working on customer partnerships and really listening in a new way to build the right kind of innovation. So we also shifted our organizational structure and we put the decision-making for innovation and investment into the region. So now within the US organization, we own the decisions as it relates to innovation and equity, and we can partner much more with our customers to ensure that we're winning. That's a big change versus being very centrally and globally driven. Yeah, big change. And sounds like a keyword there, partnership. So as you approach innovation, you know, we kind of at Reboot Chronicles look at it from a, a build by borrow perspective, borrow being partnering with um, you know, channels and product companies and services companies. And how do you guys approach that? You're kind of uh, open innovation, whatever the latest buzzwords are, but co-creation is the latest, of course, uh, because probably in the past that wasn't part of your culture, I would guess. Yeah, so I would say, you know, historically, the culture has been very much build and the foundations of these brands, right? We're building iconic and new innovations. But as we look to change our business model and the dynamics of our business overall, we really have to explore much deeper into partner as well as buy. And when you look at partnering strategies, are are they channel market focus, product focus, science? You've got all types of uh, playgrounds to uh, expand in. What, um... Yeah, I mean, I think across the board, you know, we're doing work internally when we work with R&D to say, where do we, where are we going to be the experts and where are we going to buy, right, and partner for the expertise? And then the same way when we look at customers. So where are we going to disproportionately focus and do unique things um, to bring smaller ideas to the market before we scale them is a big opportunity. Color cosmetics specifically is a very fast paced category in terms of innovation. So on an annual basis, you know, you've got two resets a year and so you're just running, 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 but how do you do that efficiently? And how do you test and learn your innovation before you scale it and still operate on that kind of speed? That's the opportunity for us. Right, and you threw in a, a, the, the, the huge ripple there. So in the midst of a global lockdown, cosmetics, luxury brands, obviously travel, a lot of sectors were just hammered. Um, but our skincare, quite frankly, you know, when we look at things like the Revive Health and Beauty Index, it's just been skyrocketing, whereas cosmetics took a, long, a break. Uh, you see that coming back now, maybe not in store as much, but uh, just the core cosmetics uh, categories starting to grow again. Yeah, I mean, so from where we were in Q2, uh, where the category really hit the bottom, there has been some recovery since then. Yep. when we're talking Q2 of 2020, but really slower than we expected. I think this pandemic has lasted much longer than any of us thought. The other piece is, um, is who has been impacted from an economic standpoint, right? So um, if you think about you know, the different cohorts and different audiences, who actually has the money in their wallet to spend? Uh, so luxury is actually rebounding faster than mass right now. So it's an opportunity for us to figure out how do we focus and prioritize the parts of our business where the recovery is happening faster, like skincare, as you mentioned. Right, right. And the um, when you look at uh, in-store versus e-commerce, we're seeing some of the mass retailers, whether it's Walgreens or CVS or Target, um, you know, starting to replan how are they going to bring their you know their uh, in-store technicians beauty advisors whatever they call them everyone's got a different name um i wouldn't call them bullish but they they are thinking and planning they, they e-commerce has gone through the roof of course we could talk about that in your business as well but how do you see the uh, at least in the americas this uh, reopening strategy in your category well, I think there's something about beauty that just inherently has to be tangible in some way. And I and despite all of the investment in digital tools, I don't think anyone yet has recreated that sensorial trial experiential 
feeling, right, that you get when you walk into a store and you work with a beauty advisor and you touch and you feel and you try things on. So as much as there's a lot of investment across the industry and digital tools to do that, I think there's just something in beauty that that consumers really miss about that shopability and, and trial driving. So I think, you know, two pieces. One is how do you create an even better experience in the digital space that that is more of a mirror to what people would have experienced in the past? But I also believe that consumers are ready to get back out there. And so as soon as it's safe to do so, as soon as the world starts to open up, I do expect a big resurgence. And specifically in color cosmetics, it's fun, right? You know, so there's a little bit of joy yes. that we can bring to our consumers' lives. I mean, even getting ready for this podcast today, right? I spent a little bit more time on my makeup than I normally would and, and you know, thought about the impact that the brand like Revlon and Elizabeth Arden and the products that I were using the impact that they have on my own confidence, right? And my own, um, how I feel as an executive and, yeah. and able to kind of get up and deliver every day. So I think people miss it and I think they're going to get back to it. Absolutely. I tend to agree with you. Uh, for those of you that are just listening in in your car and you don't see the uh, the YouTube video, um, of course you look great, but she has this beautiful uh, color speaking sensational wall behind her that I think one of her uh, friends actually painted, but it's, you know, essentially it looks like, you know, lipstick kind of uh different shades but it does kind of bring things to life makes you happier and uh i see a lot of that i mean i i, I had covid so i kind of go out in the stores and do things that probably you know i don't have to worry about it as much but i have been in a lot of these stores and i've already seen it at least in america it's just a microcosm of course in china they're back full they're back hardcore in china now uh shopping and uh, maybe not touching as much but um it, but you bring up a good point. It's like the sensorial, the, the, the touch, the feel, the advice. Um, you know, there's there's tools like, you know, Revive's uh, selfie analysis where um, people like to use that in stores. So the beauty techs will actually use that to take a picture of yourself to analyze your skin, but then get back to the personal touch. So some some consumers like that. Some, you know, they want to have it on their phone versus having it on something you touch in the store. But um, how do you feel about the whole you know, just making the category more personal, the personalization of it, if you will. Because it, we've had a couple of guests on that call it. They called it the beauty jungle. It's just so confusing. It's so many skews. How do you choose? I mean, just looking at the backdrop for you, I, I can't figure out which shade you, you you've chosen. But there's, there's it's, it might be a blend of two or three. But I'm not just saying this as a guy. I've talked to lots of women who say it's overwhelming the amount of product out there. Yeah, yeah, it it is overwhelming, and I think you know you touched on a few different things. I think that it's about being accessible to everyone in the way that they want to want to have the access. So yes, there are people who are going to want to do the virtual apps and try them on their phone, and then there are others who need that personal connection. You know, you need someone to say, "Wow, that color looks great on you," so that you can try something new and feel confident in it. So I think it's about creating a seamless consumer journey, so no matter where the consumer is starting and where they're ending in terms of a final purchase and their usage behavior, but understanding that, right? And how do we follow them and meet them where they want to be? And I think that in the future, the the expectation is going to be for beauty companies to have really a variety of tools available to support the consumer experience. Yeah, yeah, kind of meet them where they are too in this. Um, so when you look at, you mentioned innovation. So, you know, we talk about that a lot in the program, but more tangibly, how do you how do you choose where to spend your uh, you mentioned investment you know where to invest your time and your and your your money and your resources because you're interested in a growth agenda obviously you're, you're you're bringing brands back you're accelerating in different markets um what 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 are the kind of key things that you're looking at now over the next 18 months two years well you know what i what i would say is really interesting is when i joined the company the, the first thing I realized is how limited the resources were, right, to accomplish the goals we have. And so I spent a good amount of time at the beginning saying no to as much as possible, right? right. So you had to look at what is what are the innovations that we're working on that are not fit for future, right, that are behind, that are not truly differentiated and are not going to solve a meaningful problem, whether it's for consumers or for our customers. So sure. I spent a lot of time just weeding out. And trying right. to create the space for the teams to create bigger and better ideas, right, that are more strategically thought through and in partnership with our customers. 
So now we're getting to the point where you say, okay, now how do I fill up the pipeline again with those ideas that are going to be more meaningful? And I and the other piece is historically the teams thought a lot about innovation in terms of product innovation. But to win in the future, it needs to be about all types of innovation, not just product innovation. So whether it's business model innovation, whether it's how we innovate digitally to reach consumers in a different way, and even how we partner with customers on category solutions, right? How does the wall look different? Um, how do we help a customer like Walmart lower the labor in store so that they can continue to invest in their e-commerce business? Those are different problems to be solved with different types of innovation. And it's going to be the combination of bringing all of that together that's going to make the turnaround. I love it. Very refreshing. The, I'm, I'm sure it was not met with enthusiasm the first day, but uh, you kind of cleared the space. And a lot of companies, they're just, they're just, the innovation strategy is they're trying to catch up. And and you said, no, <laughs> let's just totally clean the space and see where this thing is going and see how to become a more strategic piece of it. And you also mentioned something that most people don't get because they, they look at you and say, yeah, it's a big public company. I'm like, yeah, but they're not the biggest gorilla or elephant out there. So that you do have a nimble advantage that most don't. Yeah, almost like think, yeah, almost like an right. underdog status, you know, that, that just given where you are right now in the cycle. Right. And and I love that. And I've, I've actually spent my career mostly at challenger companies. And so, you know, embracing that. And actually, as I think about coming in as a new leader in my in my over the you know, 15, 20 years that I've spent in consumer products, I've seen a lot of leaders come in. And if you come in with a big company mindset and that, you know, you're going to do it the way the number one player does, you'll always fail. So you have to really come in with how can we do it differently and how can we be different than the competition, not how do we follow them. And that's, I think, where the magic is. And when Revlon has been at its best as a company, they have really embraced that. So some of it is bringing back um, some of the historical ways of working that made Revlon great in the past. Yeah, I mean, been around since the 30s, I think, some, something like that. Yeah, it's always good to look back on the history and then figure out how do you how do you not copy that but to recreate something new so your predecessors and your the next the next people in line can look back and say wow she made the right moves at the right time you clearly are in the right place at the right time it's a fantastic challenge i don't see a lot of companies in this space uh talking about business model innovation my favorite because it really can take you anywhere landscape wise any uh any specifics that you can share around that or just giving people an idea of, especially in other industries, how, how do you look at that? What kind of lens do you use? Because, you know, you're also in charge of a PNL. You got to make the numbers and I always find some of these programs are a little tough to stretch the brands around. Yeah, I think a, a couple of things. If you look at where the inflection points are, so where is the most change happening that I don't have a solution for, right? And where are the things that are out of my control? And so COVID in some ways, Hmm. Uh, did did level the playing field to the point where you had to rethink in many areas. So when you're looking at a luxury business and you're looking at prestige brands and all department stores are closed for a period of time, it really enables you to think differently and say, what am I missing? And mm -hmm. what does this mean about the future? So how do you see around the corners, identify the areas of biggest change? And then again, you've got to take some risk. Right. So um, you've got to and you've got to build it now, assuming that the future will be what you envision it to be. So if I say where are we really focused in terms of business model and change, it's all around e-commerce mm -hmm. and in the different ways that we can approach that, whether it's direct to consumer, whether it's B2B and also in partnership with our current retail partners. Yeah, it's interesting because you've got both business models or, or, or sectors, anyway, B2B and technically b to b to c um but you're also a consumer direct now um how what's happened to the e-commerce business for your, so, your so our e-commerce business is on fire in 2020 <laughs> we allocated in a, good, in a good way yes <laughs> in a good way um we allocated a significant portion of our resources to e-commerce and so we disproportionately invested and we really benefited from it i think we went from being behind versus our competitors to at least catching up. But now the opportunity is for us to really leapfrog. And so a lot of focus is how do we get from where we are today to getting ahead um, and, and seeing the change before it happens versus following the change in terms of consumer behavior. Yeah, and you've got some great brand name recognition to help there too. I mean, even if people were doing a cold search, they're, they're gonna come up with your name in their head at some point. Um, and how, how, how does that play out? 
uh, let's just compare baby boomer generation knows the Revlon name pretty well versus the next geners. Let's call them, you know, X, Y, Z millennials, whatever that whole group. Yeah. So actually on the Revlon brand, interestingly, we have um, done a pretty good job of bringing new and younger consumers into the franchise. And so it's about bringing in the, you know, how do you find the sweet spot of being able to really appeal to a younger generation and bring them in, but really well maintaining your loyal user? And what does the balance of that look like? So I think there's a lot to be said in terms of what we do online and offline and how they come together versus their two disparate things and two disparate views of the brand. The great piece, uh, the great part about a brand like Revlon is that we play across so many segments and so many different subcategories that really there's a way that we can win across a broad age group. Um, But we are doing a lot more test and learn and things like TikTok and what we're doing in terms of the social space and engaging with not just millennial, but also Gen Gen Z consumers in a new way. And those those consumers actually are going to lead us to the future because they have much higher expectations of brands and companies in terms of, you know, what they deliver beyond just products, but what they stand for. And so it challenges us to be an even better company and not just be better brands. Yeah. The clean and green thing comes up there, of course, but, um, more, uh, just more back to the core target audiences. It's like, I can see you doing that online. It's a lot easier to differentiate and what you're going to serve up to me versus, um, someone else in a different audience, but in store, can you really do that? Yeah, I mean, you can, right? It's, so, it's more of an industry question. It's not just you. Yeah, really. I mean, I think I think it's about it's if you think about the wall, right? So when you're in store, you're looking at a color cosmetics wall. It's about how you organize the wall and how you prioritize different kinds of products and different color stories, so that you have a place to go for your loyal consumer, but that also you're exciting and bringing new people in. So we think about that a lot with innovation. We've got a whole team who's planning on a continuous basis all of the walls and looking at all of the new items and doing test and learn to figure out how do I make sure that my new items draw in new consumers, but that I don't use my lo- lose my, my loyalists at the same time. So we think a lot about graphics claims, placement, and there is a way to do both, um, although it's, it's challenging. And that's what's so exciting about color cosmetics in this industry is it's so many skews and it's so dynamic and there's so many different ways to peel the onion. Yeah, exactly. And, and whether you're in Walmart or whether you're in a tiny salon, it's uh, very different uh, approaches, I'm sure. What's been some of your, uh, I guess, your, as, as you've looked through the industry, you chose to go to Revlon, you, you've, you've done a great job at the, you know, beginning the reboot thing. What, what, anything that you really didn't expect, obviously COVID was one, we know that, but, um, biggest challenges you've had personally? Well, I mean, I had no, and not, not just COVID though, but I think the way that it forced us to work differently. So how do you integrate yourself into a new organization and, and lead around America's at 850 people and never having met a single one? Right. So I think it really challenged me just in terms of as a leader, how I connect with individuals even remotely in a way that I can build trust and camaraderie so that we can do this change together. So that for me was the biggest challenge and was very unexpected in terms of what I was going to be able to have to do to be successful. Yeah, I can relate to that. I mean, being a serial CEO most of my life, you know, coming in, having a couple of years to turn around an organization, it, it, the, the road trip was the first thing I'd always do, hit as many offices as you can, and that just was non-existent. So sounds like you play well in the virtual spaces is, as well. And, um, yeah, but I'm really, I really love to be out there. Right. So I can't wait to get in front of customers. And it, it was my plan. You know, I had yeah, actually told my family, friends and family, you probably will not see me <laughs> for at least three to six months because I'm going to be out on the road. Um, and, and really making sure that we're externally focused and, uh, that didn't happen. Not yet. So I'm hoping we actually get back to that soon. Yes. Well, you will. I mean, I assume you've been out yeah, you know, doing some uh, some shopping and looking at stores and uh, mystery. What do they call those mystery shoppers? The uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of scanning the competition and stuff. There's uh, it's a it's a very uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, category. Uh, do you think these uh, you know the whole you know uh, in terms of trends for cosmetics, skincare, whatever else you're looking at, business models? 
What do you, what do you see coming up in the next couple of years? For instance, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, clean and green. And then, um, you know, with some companies, it's just not enough differentiator. It's almost like table stakes now. Um, is so when you, when you kind of look at without giving away all your secrets, you know, how do you kind of figure out what's, what, what do the consumers want? I'm sure you guys do a lot of ethnography and not to get too geeky here, but, um, you know, sometimes they don't know what they want, but you've got some neat inventions that you know you could bring to the market. Yeah, I think actually I really agree with you on that clean is t- going to be table stakes, right? So we've all got to be running to get there as fast as possible because that's going to be what consumers are demanding. And I don't think that in six months, 12 months, you know, two years from now that it will be a differentiator. I think it will be the basics. Yeah. I think actually that the industry... Um, and the, the support structures in the industry have to catch up because we need to be able to do that in a way that we meet the consumer demand for clean, but we also meet their demand for price value equations. And so right now, packaging, um, you know, recyclable, sustainable material packaging is extremely expensive. And moving from where we are today in terms of product formulation into clean formulas can be very expensive. Consumers are not yet saying, I will pay more for it. They're demanding it. But some of the other support, you know, the industries and the sourcing actually has to catch up so that we can all get there faster as an industry. Same thing as the food industry and many others. Yes. It doesn't scale right now. I've I've found in talking to leaders around the world. And the other, I would say what I think is coming is, um, I think a change in what the expectations of beauty are. So as we think about embracing diversity in all the ways, right, that that means, I think it's not going to be one look, right, or one approach to beauty. I think beauty can evolve to truly become a meaningful form of self-expression. And mm-hmm. I think you see that a lot more when you look at what Gen Zs are doing with color cosmetics and with products. I even saw, I saw something the other day, an influencer streaming about no longer covering under eye circles, right? And embracing that as a badge of the life that you're leading and focus on other areas, right? To to beautify yourself. So things like that are really new and different. And I think they're going to surprise us all with those kinds of ideas when we listen to those consumers. Yeah. So it could be a fad, could be a trend, but yeah, more, more natural expression of yourself versus, um, um, you know, the, uh, the kind of like overdone look, but when you look at the wall behind you, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a, tr- colors are just attractive. People are like, I can actually do that. Um, and it ties into everything, hair, fashion. It's not just, you know, facial. It's just, seems like that's another opportunity. Just a little broader spectrum. Not that you should get into the fashion business, but you are in it really. Yeah. Well, we talk about, uh, coming out of COVID, right. And the resurgence that people are going to be just yeah. clamoring for color and energy and lightness and fun. And so I, I think that that's where you'll see the trends happening. Yeah. I might dye my hair purple or something just cause it's my favorite color. Um, I, I, I agree. There's, it's, I mean, you know, we, we called it revenge shopping a long time ago when China came back online, but I think it's different than that. It's, it's, you're saying it's actually a little more thoughtful and in some cases depending on the demographic maybe a little more natural maybe a little more expressional well maybe maybe it's uh, I mean, there's definitely in, in in other sectors like food and others the the health consciousness meter has gone way through the roof during this time not even sure why it's like you know a lot of a lot of people were not really taking care of themselves in, in lockdown mode but um it'll will be interesting to see how the behaviors change um, so you, you so you see a massive shift back to in in store retail um, coming back across the categories. Um, what what do you think happens to e commerce at that point? Because you've you've built a direct to consumer business on the on the backs of twenty twenty. That's probably much bigger than it used to be, right? I think it depends on. I think you have to think about what the channels are going to be for. I actually think the new shopping behaviors are very sticky. I think people who've converted to buying online are going to buy online, but I do think that consumers are looking for interaction, right? And tangible experiences. And so it's it's going to be about what the role of retail is versus what the role of e-commerce is in terms of driving a consumer journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So um, Heather, I really want to thank you for being on the uh, program. Um, I just would like to, you know, we have a lot of uh, 
people that listen into this that are probably like you, they're, they're getting ready to take a CEO job or a president job or just a VP of innovation or something, but uh, any, any words of wisdom in making the, the big leaps? You've done a couple of them now. Yeah, I, I guess I would say, um, and I, I talked about this earlier, you have to say no so that you can say yes. Right. So you have to figure out what to say no to so that you can say yes to the right things as you move forward. The other piece as I reflect and think about it is when you are an executive leader, you get a lot of information. So people are coming to you all the time, trying to sell you things, trying to share research with you, trying to get in. And so you get a view on what's happening in the world that your teams don't get. And so you have to remember that your teams, a few levels below you, are in the day-to-day and really getting caught in the weeds, and you can't expect them to be able to see everything you see. So how do you free them up to be able to see the things that you're able to see? How do you share information throughout the organization? Because I can't drive change from the top. The only way to drive the change is to enable the organization and the people who are making the day-to-day decisions And so you've got to really think about how do you do that? How do you empower an organization to drive change with you? It's not just about having a vision. It's about enabling. I love it. The uh, don't be the VP of no for too long, but uh, be the uh, the CEO enabler. That's uh, good. Good words of wisdom. Thanks for joining us. This is Dean Tobias and the Reboot Chronicles. We want to thank you for joining us today and uh, listen in soon. Thank you. Take care.